Fai is an associate professor of computer science at the University of Paris Diderot. His research interests span formal methods and their applications to improve package quality and user experience in the context of free software distributions. He has been involved in the Debian project since 2001, taking care of many tasks ranging from package maintenance to distribution-wide quality assurance. He has led the Debian project since April 2010. Without further ado, here is Stefano. Thanks. So apparently I have the honor of being uh, the only speaker coming from the other side of the ocean. Uh, so allow me to be jet lagged a bit. If I doze off, feel free to shout. I probably just fell, fell asleep. <laughs> um, so thanks for the introduction. Thanks for inviting me here. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk about Debian, of course. So I'm, I have the honor to represent the pro of representing the project. And I've been representing the project for the past three years as Debian project leader. And in this talk, I plan to go about into some detail about how a project like Debian is organized. But before doing so, uh, I want you to give my take on what free software is. I don't expect you to read this quotation in detail. So the quotation is, uh, is from a book by Cory Doctorow, which has been kind of popular as of lately. It's a book called Makers, which has been like popularizing to the, to the masses the idea of do it yourself, and in particular, the usage of machines like 3D printers. And I, I believe most of you are familiar with the notion of free software, and there are probably you have been exposed to different way of presenting it. So on one, on one side of the camp, you have the people presenting it as a development methodology. So you develop software in the open source way, and your software will be better. And on the other side, you have people more with more ideological grounds saying that free software is about user freedoms. So my take, the take that I want to offer you today, is kind of different. Is one in terms of control. So in this quote, one of the main characters of the book, which is Lester, is basically explaining to one of his peers that the, your life, if you don't control the tool you use, will be miserable. And here the example is with a screwdriver. So with a screwdriver, you can do whatever. You, once you buy the tool, you can do whatever you want with it. You can crash it. You can use it properly or improperly. It doesn't matter. It is your to control. Okay. But we live in days where software is more and more pervasive in our lives. Not only software controls your mobile phone, your access to social network, your communication over uh, email or, or through the web. Okay? Software controls way more. It controls your car. It might control some medical device you need to survive, like peacemakers. Okay? It might control even your, I don't know, your blender. Okay? You know, once upon a time, blenders were completely mechanical machines. Nowadays, even blenders have software. Okay? And the point of free software for me is being in control of your devices. Okay? In particular, I, couldn't, I can't stand the idea that as devices move more and more towards softwares, we as customers lose our ability to control them just because they're moving, to, they're moving towards software. The only way to retain the kind of control you had with mechanical and electronic device is to have the software that runs those devices completely free. Okay? So this is my take on free software and something I want to, to, to offer you in case you, you might appreciate this point of view. So, and this idea is a kind of very powerful. Okay? And this idea which has been proposed more than 20 years ago by Richard Stallman and then uh, supported by the Free Software Foundation. And there's been something that has been a motivation for a lot of people to develop software that respect user freedoms. Okay? And in the early days, once you have developed the software, well, you need to bring those software to your users. Okay? You need to have users actually able to run those software. Otherwise, your software is, is, is completely useless. So, and this is the idea of how users used to download and install free software in the early days. You are most of you are computer science students, so you probably are familiar with that because you want to grab the latest development version of software, and that's fine. But back then, it was the only way to use software. So essentially, you had to download the source code version of some software because that's source code is one of the points of the software. Okay? So you start from there. And you had to okay, verify that you actually downloaded the, the right table, that no one has tampered the software you've been downloading between, the, between uh, the producer side and your side. And then you had to go to this magic sequence that the first time I saw that it was kind of a religious mantra. Okay? You need to do configure, make, and make install. And we all pray to this mantra, and magically the software will be installed. But then you discover that at configure time, maybe you're missing some other software you need. 
at make point, maybe you don't know, can fight with messages which were completely incomprehensible to me, like uh, symbol not found, that the make installed errors like cannot create a regular file, blah, blah, blah. Okay? So this way of in distributing and deploying software was actually mixing up two different roles. So it was assuming, essentially, that the users were also all developers. And that, in some sense, is fine, because it means that your users, the people who are good enough to install your software, are also able to contribute back to it. So that's a positive way of seeing that. But it's also a way to say, OK, no one of the greater user base, you might imagine, of people who are not developers will be able to use your software. Okay? And this is the idea of how we use to distribute free software in the early days. And then someone came up with this interesting idea. Okay? I believe the first occurrence of the idea came up from the BSD camp with the port system. And the idea is this notion of a distribution. Okay? And it's a pretty simple idea nowadays where we all have app stores in our mobile phones, right? So the idea is that there is an intermediary between people who develop software and people who use software. And this intermediary, a distribution or a distribution editor, take care of various things. First of all, it's create the granularity of package. So it offers you software in Unity that you can install, or remove, and upgrade independently one another. Okay? And it also selects software for you. So it guarantees that there is some kind of review on the software. It guarantees that you don't get malware via the, the distributor can channel. It gives you some integration. So it, go, it guarantees you that the software works well together. Okay? And it offers you a couple of specific kind of applications. Package managers, the stuff you use to manage your packages, and installers. That's not terribly relevant for mobile phones, but it's very relevant for PC and desktop. So unless you have bought a PC or, or a laptop which can pre-install with some free software system, you need to install the system, and you need some specific software to do that. So this is what distribution do. Okay? And Debian is one of those distribution. Historically, is one of the first, but is not really the first. There was already another distribution back then, which is called SLS. And SLS was a soft landing Linux system, or something like that. Okay, and but it was not soft landing at all. Okay, so there was this guy, which has a lot of similarities with you people. So this guy called Ian Marduk. It was 1993. I don't remember his age, but he was a student at Purdue University, which, unless I'm failing spectacularly at geography, is not far away from here. And in his own spare time, he decided to create a new distribution. Okay, and why did so? basically to overcome most of the limitation of this alternative system, which was called SLS. And he had a few very important intuitions. So more than the system that he ended up creating, he had the intuition that there was a problem with the way we were, they, they were doing distributions back then. So all, everyone was doing software in the open source way. So they were collaboratively developing software. Okay? So it was not a single person in charge of software, but many people working together on that software. But on the distribution, it was not the case. So distribution were mostly one-man one band shows. Okay? And he said, that's not right. We need to make also the process of creating distribution something which is more collaborative. Okay? So he had this idea, and essentially created Debian with the idea of making Free software, GNU Linux back then was, the, was mainly the, the most interesting option, but free software in general, competitive with commercial OS. So we are 19 years later, it, does, it is not really happening yet, except on the mobile phone market. So it took some time. The idea was to make it easy to install, but the easiness back then had nothing to do with what we imagine today. Okay, easiness back then meant like, I don't need to spend half a day doing that, as Amber mentioned this morning. Okay? Uh, but more importantly, he said, OK, I don't want to be the only one creating this distribution. I think people should flock together, and a group of people should maintain distribution. And more importantly, I think that packages that, are, that form the distribution should be maintained by people who are expert in those softwares. Okay? So the maintainer of a given software should be someone that knows very well that software so that it can give more quality um, support to the user. Uh, and so, essentially, Debian has not been the first distribution, but it's been the first one developed in an open way 
transparently and collaboratively explicitly inspired to the, to the spirit of the GNU project. Okay? And actually, it has also been supported in its begin their beginnings by the Free Software Foundation. I think the first year of two years of Debian has been supported by the Free Software Foundation. Okay, so this is how all this started. 16 of August 1993, this message posted to a, to a news group, that was the, the, the massive way of communicating back then, announcing the completion of this system. Um, so what is Debian? It's three things at a time. It's an operating system, so something technical you can install in your machine. It's a project, a group of people with specific goals, and it is a community. Okay? So let me just go very briefly to the technical part. So this is kind of the, market, the technical marketing of Debian. So if you want to doze off for a couple of slides, feel free to. I wake you a couple, in a couple of slides. So uh, the main product we do is what we call Debian Stable. Okay? So we do a distribution which is meant to be installed on machines with that, that want to be, stay stable for a while, ideally three, four years. Okay? So what we do is not for the, for the bleeding edge market. If you want to something that is really bleeding edge, the last related software, you won't find it in Debian stable. If you want a desktop or a server machine that is stable and stays stable for a while, that you will find in Debian, okay? in Debian stable. Okay? So it's a binary distribution, meaning that we compile the software and you just have to install it using the package manager. It's completely free, so we are deeply rooted in the notion of free software, so you won't find anything which is not free on the Debian main archive. It's released more or less every two years, okay, and it supports a huge number of architectures, which supports something like 12 different hardware architectures, and actually we support more than one kernel. So we are on one of the very few uh, distributions out there supporting something, not only Linux as a kernel, but also FreeBSD and the GNU herd. Um, we offer archive-wide support for all the archive, okay? So we don't security support for all the archive. So it's not only a few packages where you will receive security updates, but you will receive security updates for all the packages in the archive. And actually, one of the things we are most renewed for is the size of the package archive. So this is the, uh, the size of the Debian archive over time. And nowadays, we have something like 35,000 binary packages in the archive, which will be released with the next version of Debian. Uh, and then, so in this release, various things happen, okay? So this is the last release we made, which is kind of old nowadays. It's been released in February 2001. And in, in one such release, many things could happen. So it took a couple of years to release Debian Squeeze. And some of the most technically relevant things that happened has been the switch to a dependency-based boot, boot system. It's been the removal of all non-free firmware from the kernel, meaning that also down to the firmware, to the firmware level, you only, you only get free bits unless you explicitly ask for. Uh, and we added support for this different kernel, which is the K3BSD. So essentially, it means using the Debian packages based on a kernel which is not Linux, but it is the FreeBSD kernel. Uh, and then you, can, you find a lot of different fla flavors of Debian. So we have a general distribution for uh, common use cases, but we also have specific customization for specific needs. In particular, we are very popular in the scientific side, uh, in the scientific world, so we have customization of Debian for education, for medicine, for uh, GIS uh, communities, for chemistry, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what happened in Debian Squeeze. And then this is something of the, of the stuff which is going to happen in the next release, which is called Debian Wizard. Okay? Uh, so one of the most important technical changes which is going to happen is multi hark What is multi hark is the possibility of installing packages compiled for different architectures, the same package compiled for different architecture on a single machine. So it is pretty common nowadays for uh, x86 architecture to support at the same time binaries built in 32 bits and 64 bits. Okay? So we have found a clean way of doing that. We have been proposing that to a lot of other distributions, and this is finally happening. We have, we have a good, um, important thrust toward the possibility of creating private clouds. So we have a fairly uh, principled position on clouds. We, can, we are kind of weary of public clouds, where you get away, you have to give away all your data to have your computation happen elsewhere. So we want to push instead for the creation of private clouds. And we are making Debian an uh, easy platform where to do that. Uh, we are adding new platforms, new architectures. So on one end, on the very small side, we are adding support for this architecture, which is called ARMHF, which is for mobiles and for, with high performance in floating-point operations. And on the other end of the scale, we are adding support for an architecture called S390XX, which is for using for mainframes and virtualized machines. Uh, and then, of course, we are revamping all the version of the software we have in the archive. We did freeze last June. And it usually takes 
about six months to release what we have frozen, okay? There is no specific date left because we have this mantra that we release when it's ready, so when all the critical bugs has been fixed. But I think you could expect Debian, to be, Debian Wheezy to be released either by the end of the year or in January next year. Uh, so end of the promotional part, please wake up. We go back to the second third of Debian. So the second third of Debian is a project. What do I mean with a project? A project is, a, for me, in this context, is a group of people with a common goal. And the common goal here, it's creating the best possible free operating system. Okay, so this is the great goal that brings Debian, member of the Debian project together. And this project is articulated in a couple of documents, which, has not been, which have not been created together at the beginning of Debian, but shortly, shortly after. So the first document that defined the Debian project is what we call the Debian social contract. So what is that? It's an agreement between the members of the Debian project, which we also call Debian developers, but keep in mind that it's a more general notion than only technical developers. So it's an agreement, I was saying, between members of the project and the free software community at large. And it's based on four notions. So the first one is the commitment to keep Debian completely free. So this is a commitment we make in, uh, with respect to the people that use Debian. Then there is a commitment to transparency. So it was mentioning that this was a, an important innovation when Debian was born. And the idea is that we don't have hidden agendas, we don't have a private mailing list to discuss technical matters, and we try to discuss everything in the open. So we do not hide problems because we, we don't have an interest in doing so. And then there is a commitment, which is a kind of a commitment to the ecosystem. So the idea is that we do not make changes to software, to free software, only for our needs. But the changes we do make are given back to the free software community. This is kind of mandatory for copyleft licenses, but it's not necessarily mandatory for all the licenses out there. So we have an extra commitment to do so as a member of Debian. And then there is a kind of a guidance to how we make decision. And the, gui the, the guideline here is that our principles, our uh, priorities, sorry, are users and free software at the same ground. So this is a kind of a ethical statement of the Debian project. And then there is a constitution. And this, for me, is something fascinating because people who decided back then to, uh, to work together on the Debian project decided to write down the rules that govern the project. And they did so in a way very similar to how states get formed. So they, they wrote down a real constitution which sets basically the rules of how things happen in Debian. And if you want, the basic principle here are a sort of democracy but corrected for the way free software works. So it's democracy where it is more important to do stuff than to decide and vote on things. And I will come back to this point later. And all this, together with the principle of, uh, of the project, has been a strong motive for people to join. So Debian has been credited several times as one of the largest purely volunteer-based community in free software these days. And in terms of project members, so people who have decided to commit to the project and abide to the constitution. We, have, we are something like 1,000 members worldwide, and we basically follow the distribution of IT in the world. So there is a high density of Debian developers in Europe. There is a high density of Debian developers in the, in the US. And there is growing density in other parts of the world, in Australia, in, in South America, in, uh, in India, and in, in, uh, in East Asia. Okay? So this is really a worldwide project. For me, it's been uh, really incredible to, to know people from everywhere around the world thanks to Debian. And all these people are committed to the same ideals. The third ingredient, and last one, is the community. So you know that around uh, every free software project tend to uh, grow a community. And every community has their own specificities. And the specificity of Debian or the Debian community are related to the way we do things. So there is a lot of open development. So, and the fact that there is a open development mean actually that it's very easy to have an impact on what we do. So Debian is really an empowering community. So it's a bit demanding in terms of technical skills to join, but once you're able to know the technical skill you need, it's really easy to have an impact. It's just enough to show that you have a change and improvement to propose. And if you are able to propose it and to show that it's sound, it's very easy to have this improvement get in the project. And then there is a large amount of communication. So we are a bit of style, old style in the way we communicate. So most of it is through mailing lists and IRC. There is a growing use of social media, but 
we are a bit picky on the kind of social media we use. We try to use free social medias, and there are not that many out there. Uh, and the kind of user we have are mostly tech-savvy users. So it's very common for, to get bug report from Debian users that actually already contains the patch to improve and to fix the deficiency the user has encountered. So this is kind of the traits of the Debian community. So I presented you the, the three ingredients of Debian, so a project, an operating system, and uh, a community. And the three work together in very complex ways. So I'm not going to describe this in detail. But there is an important interaction among these three, thing, these three actors. So essentially, the three actors work together on a technical system, which is just different set of packages. Okay? So there is a development set of packages that we call Debian Unstable, where as soon as there is a new version of some software, well, it gets kicked in, and it's available for kind of bleeding edge users. Okay? So at every single level of the Debian quality process, people could use what we do. Okay. On my laptop, I use a routine, which I use day to day for work. It's the, I'm running di directly the development version of Debian, which is called Unstable. Okay. And then we have some automatic process after, uh, after some time, after a package has been in Unstable for a while, and after it has been built for all the architecture we support, it automatically migrates to what we call Debian testing, unless some specific important issues have been reported. Okay. So Debian testing is not a product, so we do not advertise that as something that is meant for final users, but is actually a very good mixture of recent software and something which has been tested by several other people before reaching your computer. So it's kind of a very um, good intermediary release that is good both if you are doing development and if, or if you want to do some, uh, if you want to have some bleeding edge software even for your desktop. And finally, periodically we decide, okay, we stop for a moment. We stabilize what we have, so we stop the automatic flow of package from unstable to testing. Okay? And we say, okay, now we finalize what we have, we get rid of all serious bugs we have been reported, and only when all those bugs have been fixed, then we release a new version of Debian, which we call Debian Stable. Okay? And all other actors play a role here. So we have the official project members, which are usually those who can do uploads to the, to the, to the main archive. We have users that report bugs, which are fundamental for quality assurance. And we, have the, um, and we have the system, which is the result of all this work together. Okay? So this is, a, I think, a rather in-deep overview of the Debian project. But then Debian is not the only distribution out there. Okay? So if you look at the distribution review sites, you can find hundreds and hundreds of distributions. So the idea, the concept of distribution has been something that has been quite popular. Okay? And you find hundreds of distribution out there. And every single distribution have, has different traits with respect to the other. You find different release cycles. You find different uh, target public as users. You find different communities. You find different look and feels, different choice of user interfaces, which is, which is a topic for really popular trolls on the internet. Okay? So it is kind of important to realize what are the specific parts of a distribution, whatever it is. So, and I have a, a take on mine of what makes Debian special, what makes Debian different from the other, which is based on four simple ideas. So the first one is a kind of obsession with quality. So something that surprised me when I actually started to be, to be interested in the Debian community is this kind of uh, passion for quality, this perfectionism, okay, which is not always something positive, but it is definitely a trait of the Debian community. So we do have design documents. So we have a, a document called the Debian policy, which is, you can imagine it is a specification of how a package should behave. Okay? And we have plenty of automatic testing that actually stress test packages to see if they respect this document. Okay? So this is a kind of a, uh, design mindset that you find in Debian. And also uh, this notion that we have seen descend directly from the initial ideas of Ian Mardock that package maintainers are actually software experts. So they know the software they are developing. They are able to put their hands in to patch it. And that means that when you report a bug against the Debian package, you usually find someone who can offer some high quality feedback to, to your bug report. And then you have this idea that all packages are equal. You do not find distinction in the archive, so either a package is in the Debian archive or is out. And if it is in, the quality standards you must support are the same for all other packages. Okay? 
So the first point for me is package quality. We have a kind of obsession with package quality, and we try to enforce it in the system where it is. The second point is freedom, in the sense of software freedom. So it is grounded in the documents that create the Debian community, so in the social contract in particular. Uh, and it is interesting because thanks to those principles, Debian has become a sort of a political actor in free software. So if you look around, back then when we had the problem of license proliferation, people inventing new licenses every two days, there were essentially three actors deciding whether a software license was free or not. One was the Free Software Foundation, the other one was the Open Source Initiative, and the third one was Debian. Okay? So we, we have got this role of deciding what is free and what is not, and people look at us when we decide if something is free or not. So if people wonder, is this really free? They often ask, okay, what Debian thinks of that? And this is kind of a, a pride for Debian. And also, Debian is a system which is completely free in all its aspects. Not only in the software that gets in your hand, but also there is a huge amount of dog fooding. Okay? So what we do, all the infrastructure we do, is completely free. Nobody in Debian would accept using non-free infrastructure to create a free operating system. We would consider that uh, incoherent and it wouldn't be acceptable. And all this is something that people know, so our community know about that. User trust us to believe, to, to not betray those principles. And I think that over time has set a very high bar for advocate of software freedoms. And this is something I'm pretty proud of. The third point is very important from an, economic, an economical point of view, is independence. So if you look around at the most popular distributions out there, you essentially can associate to each of them a company. Okay? That's not bad. Actually, it's very good. There are companies out there which are spending a lot of money in creating free software distribution, and that's good. In Debian, that's not the case. So you cannot name a single company that is behind Debian. We have plenty of companies donating, say, hardware to us. For instance, most of the uh, s uh, server we use to rebuild packages have been, don have been donated by companies. But there is no single company that could claim to control Debian. Okay? We live up to don on donations, so from people or from companies. And everything else is gift economy. So exchange of technical contributions in exchange of you know, pride uh, or uh, happiness to contribute or all this kind of stuff. And this is very remarkable in the world of today's distributions. And actually, is, uh, I think it's important not only for users that know that our choice are not driven by profit, but it also creates a playing field where companies could contribute without having fear that they are contributing favoring their, 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 competi their competitors. Okay? So this is truly remarkable today. And the last point is decision making. And this gives me a chance to tell you something about Debian Constitution. So the way we take decision in Debian, it's based on a principle that they started to call duocracy. And this principle is embodied in this point of the Debian constitution that says that an individual developer in Debian may make any technical or non-technical decision with regard to their own work. What does this mean? It means that as long as you are doing something, you are working on your own package. Okay? As, your work, as, lo as long as you are doing your work up to the quality standard of the distribution, Nobody could come up and tell you, no, you're doing it wrong. You need to do it in a different way. Unless that person is willing to step in and do the work at your place. I call it duocracy and not, say, meritocracy, because this principle does not allow to, you know, having a reputation because in the past you did very good stuff. You have a reputation in Debian as long as you keep on doing good stuff. As long as you stop doing stuff, and if others are willing to do that in your place, you need to step back. Okay? So this is the main principle that guides how we do stuff in Debian. And the second principle is democracy. We tend not to use that for technical decisions. So uh, we have a kind of a standard body mantra that we, leave, we believe in a rough, rough consensus and working code. Okay? But for political decision, like say what we consider very real, do we have a doubt we want to vote on whether that license is free or not? We could do that or take a position on uh, some uh, great project change like how we decide who is a member of the project or this kind of stuff. We can vote. And every single citizen of the Debian project can decide and make a decision that change completely the course of action. Okay? Uh, we use that also for the election of the Debian project leader. But the real power 
is in the hand of the Debian project members. Voting, they can change any single aspect of the project. And in practice, this means that the, the reputation of people is tied to the, uh, the good work they do and they keep on doing. It means that there is no oligarchy or benevolent dictator governing Debian. Even the Debian project leader is mostly a coordinator role. It's not something that can really impose his decision, if not by moral suasion on others. And it means, essentially, that there are no imposed decisions in the project by people who have the infrastructure or who have the money to pay people or uh, have employees or the like. Okay, so these four things together, for me, makes Debian a pretty unique distribution among all other distributions you could find out there. And finally, there is a kind of a fifth point, which, is, which has become pretty important in the past, let's say, 10 years. Okay, and it's the idea of derivatives. So I didn't lecture you on the software freedoms, the kind of the mantra for the more the people who believe in the ethical part of the software. But they're pretty interesting. And the last two freedoms actually can be applied to something larger than a single piece of software. So the last two freedoms in the common definition for software are the freedom to redistribute copies of something you got under a free, under a free software license and the possibility to change that something and to redistribute your changes. And usually, we think at, you think about those freedoms in terms of single pieces of software. Okay? But we can apply them to, to a whole distribution. You take an existing distribution, say Debian. You reuse all the packages you want. Possibly, you rebuild the packages from scratch. You add some packages if they're not in Debian yet. Uh, possibly, you change existing packages, adding your patches. And periodically, you sync. Okay? This is pretty difficult to do. It's not as easy as it seems, because only the infrastructures to do all this, it's very complex to set up. Okay? But it could be done. And all this, if you do that to an entire distribution, what you obtain is what we call a derivative distribution. And a derivative distribution is something, the idea of that we can do distribution this way has been a game changer in the way we distribute software in the past 10 years. So uh, essentially, the interesting part is all about the process. Okay? So if you do a derivative distribution, you need only to focus your energy besides setting up the infrastructure, which is huge work. But everything in addition to that is essentially focusing on customization. You can start from a system that exists and customize it for your target public. Okay? Uh, and you need power mainly only to do that. Okay? Uh, and if we do this properly, that's great. Because the original distribution, the source distribution, actually through the derivative distribution can reach out to an entirely new public that probably it, it, it wasn't able to reach out to before, okay, all along. Uh, and the derivative, of course, gains on all the work that has already been done in the source distribution. Um, and it, as it happens, Debian is a source for an incredibly large number of Debian distributions. In the usual uh, distribution review sites, you can find something like 150 distributions which are based on Debian, meaning that they take packages that have been worked on in Debian. They do change if they're rebuilt or not, depending on the model they've chosen. And what they obtain is a new distribution customized for a specific public. And why all those distributions have chosen Debian as their base for customization? My take is that. Choosing Debian, they have a, a ground, a base that, there is, that there has already been reviewed for quality and licensing, and licensing issues. So one thing less to, to worry about. Okay. They have a solid base system. They have a huge amount of packages that are, that are ready, 30,000 packages you can base your work on. Okay. And we have this, mon this uh, motto, this mantra of being the universal operating system, meaning that we are not particularly customized for a specific use case. So if you want to customize your own derivative distribution for a specific use case, it's easier to start from something that is meant to be generic than start from something that has been already customized, possibly for a use case different than yours. Okay? So these are, these are the reasons why all those distributions have chosen Debian as a basis. And an example you probably know of is this not very well-known Debian distribution called Ubuntu. Okay, no, I'm kidding. So Ubuntu is a distribution that has been started in 2004 by a company called Canonical. And today is credited to be the most popular Linux distribution out there. 
okay? The stats we have talk about something like 20 times more popular than, uh, than Debian, but actually I think they have figures telling that in next year they will be selling 5% of the desktop, mar desktop uh, computer in the world will be coming out on the market with Ubuntu pre-installed. Okay? I don't know if the figures are true or not, but that's pretty impressive. Okay? So it's the most popular free software system out there, uh, at least for desktop and laptops. And, um, and here is how it relates to Debian. So essentially, if you look at the last Ubuntu distribution out there, you have something like three quarters of the distribution, which are packages which, came, which come unmodified from Debian. You have something like 15% of the packages which are Debian packages modified and integrated into Ubuntu. And you have about 10% of packages which are new packages which are not available in Debian, but are available in Ubuntu. Most of them are uh, upstream software developed by Canonical, and which, has, which have not yet been integrated into Debian. And that is, I, I think it's great. Okay? Because based on the work done in Debian, they're managing, they, they've managed to build the most popular GNU Linux distribution out there. And also, what has happened to Debian is happening to them. So if you look around, you'll find something like 80 derivative distribution based on Ubuntu, which means distribution transitively based on Debian. Okay? And all this is, is great, but it also means that you probably rely on Debian more than you have imagined. Okay? It means that if you are using any one of those distributions which are transitively based on Debian, well, you, you depend on the work which is being done on Debian. Pretty much as Debian depend on the work which is being done by the author of the software we package together and we pack up together in a distribution. And this is great, and it essentially means that the way we are distributing software is changing. Okay? So once it was something like this, a single intermediary, a distribution between the software authors and the users, which several in, with several interesting workflows. So software flow from left to right here, it passes through the distribution in which is the user. And in the other direction, you have bug reports and patches, which come from the user sometime, come from the distribution other times, and flow back to the, uh, to the software author. And now it's becoming more long. Okay? Essentially, we have a pipeline of software distributors which are based on one another. Okay? So in reality, it's more complex because every single actor could add new software which is not packaged and to, to their left, but still the, the idea remains. So you have uh, people developing upstream software. You have uh, a first-tier distribution like Debian. You have, might have a second-tier distribution like Ubuntu. You might have a third-tier distribution like uh, Lubuntu or, or whatever. Okay? And this is great because at every single step, you reach out to a new public. Potentially, you reach out to new developers. Okay? A huge amount of Debian developers in the last year are people that probably would have never heard about free software if it were not for Ubuntu. Okay? They, heard free so they heard the idea of free software from Ubuntu because they do marketing way better than we do with the specific publics, especially with the desktop market. They discover Ubuntu, they discover free software, they discover that Ubuntu is based on Debian, and say, hey, I want to do packaging. I'm good at doing packaging. But I prefer to do that directly, upstream to the left in Debian, so that my work benefit more people. Okay? So this is great. But we need to pay attention to the fact that it should be sustainable. So people doing Debian, people doing free software upstream, usually don't ask for anything in return because that's part of the idea of doing free software. But if we want to make all this sustainable, there are a couple of rules that you need to think about whether you are a downstream project, whether you are a company using free software and relying on work done. And the point is that you need to be aware of what the software you're using comes from. You need to give credit to that origin and you need to try to give back your changes. So the goal should be that at every single step where we are in this pipeline, we try to take our changes and we try to integrate them upstream, further to the left. We try to do that in Debian with our upstream. We expect others to do the same with us. And, but wherever you are, if you are, doing, if you are changing something for software, that's a great power that you have with, with free software. You can change stuff. Please think about this. If you want the whole system to be sustainable, you need to work in having your changes integrated upstream, whatever you have upstream to your left. Um, 
So this is, this is essentially it. So I wanted to present you this idea about Debian and what the kind of ecosystem that Debian is allowed to create. So let me just try to convince you that it could be a good idea for you to contribute to Debian. Okay? So just a few concluding slides on how you can contribute to Debian if you're interested in that. So first, the first part is not really interesting for, for you, but it's more interesting for companies in general. But they, the point here is that even a project like Debian, which is made mainly almost 100% by volunteers, need to have some kind of interaction with the real world. Okay? So only our infrastructure for managing all the Debian infrastructure archive and the like, is something like 120 servers around the world. And that's not considering the build demons. Okay? This is not considering the machine that's actually need to build packages for every single architecture we support. No, everything else, development machine, are something like 120 servers around the world. That's pretty big. Only in replacing server every single area, we need something like 30K USD or something, only to keep you know, the server fresh and keep them on work. So we do use resources. And the most important thing we do with the money we have that we receive from donations is allow developers, volunteers, to travel, to meet together, to have fun, and to work together. If you will ever have a company that, is a, that has an interest in free software, and if you're figuring out how you can help free software projects, allowing them to meet is possibly the single most important thing you could do to help uh, free software projects made of volunteers. The second part, and I think it's the most interesting part for, uh, for, uh, for all, uh, all of us in this room, is actually contributing to that yeah, with your time, with your work, with your competence. So there are all kinds of different contributions you can do. As a user, Keep always in mind that reporting a bug is possibly the single most important contribution you could do to any free software project out there. Learning how to report a bug properly so that the, the, the developers will be able to reproduce it, give feedback to them when they have questions, that's crucial. That's the only way you can advance, like advance the state of the quality of some free software project not being a, an actual developer. Okay? So this is the single most important contribution you could do. Or you can work on all other kind of, uh, let's say, non-development parts, like uh, translations or like documentation. Or you can have an interest in packaging. And if you have an interest in packaging, well, then you can start to think, may, usually this is the step where people start to think, maybe I should be more involved. And usually you end up thinking, OK, I probably should join Debian. OK, joining Debian is a kind of uh, articulated process. So we have different roles. You can maintain packages in the Debian archive, even if you are not a member of the Debian project. You just need someone, you just need to find someone that will review your work, will start, start to trust you, and will do the uploads for you. Okay, so this is a pretty interesting mentor-mentee relationship that you can try to set up. Or you can decide you want to become a Debian maintainer, DM. A Debian maintainer is a person with an interest only in a specific set of packages, one, two, a handful. Okay? We want to say, okay, I'm committed to the project, but I'm only interested in doing package maintenance work on this specific package. So if you do that, if you show you're able to do your work, you, will gain, you can gain access to the archive, and you will be able to upload in autonomy your own package. Or you can decide that you want to, be, to become a member of the Debian project. And if you become a member of the Debian project, essentially you become, the idea is to think that you're becoming a Debian citizen. Someone who will have a say in Debian matters. Someone who will be able to vote on all Debian matters. Okay? And to do that, you need to decide that you agree with the principle of Debian project. You will go through a kind of examination process to, see, to check that we are on the same page for what concern uh, free software principles. And if you're interested in technical work, you will also be checked on your ability to do packaging work. But to become a Debian project member, you actually do not need to do packaging work. Actually, any kind of contribution to the project which is uh, sustained and that you can be uh, shown that you're able to do that, that's enough to, be, to, to consider making you a member of the Debian project. My, cons my tips, if you want to become part of Debian, is just to pick a team, find an interest, look at the available teams, look at if there are teams in the Debian project that work on something you're interested in, start to hang around with them, okay? hang out with them. Stay on their mailing list. Stay on the, uh, their IRC channels. Start to help them out with triaging the bugs they have. 
if you want to do developing stuff, start to make patches and ask them, what do you think? Do you think this patch will fix bugs? And so on and so forth. And everything else will just happen. So if you want to know more, well, there are plenty. These are the usual resources. There is the web. There is the wiki. You can hang, around, hang out in our uh, social media websites, so social media sites, or ask me. I'll be around for the rest of the day. I need to leave tomorrow morning quite early, but if you have other questions that you don't feel like asking here, just poke me. I will be happy to answer. Uh, last comment before leaving some time for questions. So my suggestion is to, during your studies, to actually think about what you want to do with your spare time. You can, I suggest to spend your spare time in something big, something that passionates you. Even if it's something that doesn't seem have any uh, possibility of finding you a job or making you gain more. Just find something you're passionate about. Okay? If you do that, maybe you will end up being like Ian Murdoch, student like you 20 years ago, was in the end invented something that is the basis for the most popular Linux distribution out there today. Thank you. Yes? When did uh, K3BSD happen and how many people use it? OK, so, um, it, so the port has been uh, in the working for several years now, I think five or six at least. Uh, it has been released as part of the Debian stable release for the first time with, the, with Squeeze, so two years ago. Uh, regarding the number of users, I don't know. We have statistics. We have popcorn.debian.org where you can see the statistics. I know that it's pretty interesting for some uh, uh, storage system that want to use ZFS, which is a file system which is only available at the moment for K3BSD. So it is used in production in quite important and large installations. But I don't know the actual number of users. But you can find it out on popcorn.debian.org. Yes? Have you ever considered making the Debian testing uh, the desktop distribution. Okay, so, this is a, so the question is, have we, have we ever thought about making Debian testing a desktop distribution? This is a question I got asked fairly often. Uh, I've been, uh, so it's been pointed out that probably one of the biggest mistakes of Debian has been underselling the Debian testing distribution. Uh, so my take on that is that it's, there is quite a hype on rolling distributions. Debian testing is essentially the distribution was invented, rolling distribution, about 10 years ago. Uh, I think it's the best possible distribution for desktops who want to have kind of bleeding edge software, but which is tested a bit. The main problem is in period like this one. Because right now we have frozen testing to, st to stabilize the next stable release. So this essentially means that for the six months we are working on stabilizing the next Debian stable, testing essentially slows down. So if you, if you exclude, if you avoid thinking about this period, I think Debian testing is perfect for the desktop. In this period, a bit less so. When I try to uh, introduce friends to Linux in a more involved way, I'm like just using it but it's to make them hack it or just try to understand mm -hmm. the system, it's a bit hard to advise them to use a testing distribution. I mean the name. Oh, yeah, you the name too. Yeah, yeah, I know. So we probably need to market them in a better way. So let's say that. On names, we are kind of have a permanent understatement in Debian. So the, we call unstable what it should be called development. So it's not really unstable. It's my work machine. But I know. You're, you're right. Yes? Uh, your role as Debian product man uh, leader, what does that entail? OK. Not product manager, please. Uh, <laughs> so the Debian project leader is essentially various things. So it is the. The, the public face of Debian, so it's selected yearly by all the developers. Um, it is a kind of a management role in the sense of like uh, solving conflicts that could arise, arise in the project. Uh, it takes care of the assets of the Debian project, so deciding how money are used. Okay, it does commu communications, so go to conference and and also it's a kind of uh, uh, what is the. Uh, U.S. name for the uh, Minister of External Policies, the, the 
the Secretary of State, fine. So essentially, I take, I, I take care of the uh, politics with other, all other actors that are in the free software world, including companies, including uh, political entities like the Free Software Foundation, and I do this kind of uh, political work with them. Yes? So um, many software projects suffer from the problem of bloat, <laughs> and open source projects are you know, liable to have more. I suppose you've got a democracy. Anybody can add more and more and more features. Um, so how do you handle bloat, and is this derivative distribution a way of dealing with it? So I've never thought of that in that way, but yes, I think that this ecosystem of derivatives, it is a way of dealing with bloat. Um, most of the typical problems of bloat that happens in, in software development is something that it does not uh, eat us, but eat our upstream. So we do the packaging work, and if there is a bloat problem, we will just replicate the bloat problem that would have existed anyway in upstream software projects. And uh, uh, part of the bloat problem is related to the interaction among different softwares, and we deal with that with the dependency system of the Debian packaging system, which, in my opinion, is one of the uh, best in terms of formalization of relationship among packages. So that is, too, a way of dealing with, blo with bloat. A related issue we have in Debian, and it's not that common in other projects, is that we are a very old project. So almost 20 years for a free software project is really, really large. That means that we are starting to see issues that are not that common, like um, the aging of development, not in terms of personal age, but in terms of interest in the project. So we see people going away after five or six years of interest and coming back after five or six more years. So all this, you know, they stop, they get married, they make children, and then they come back later. When... So it's pretty interesting. So we have this kind of aging problem, and you... It's not like it's difficult to deal with, just that it's kind of new and relatively unknown in many software projects out there. Yes? What does Tough Environment or Window Manager do you use? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Let's start with the geek, geek moment. So personally, I use GNOME 3 in fallback mode with Awesome as a Window Manager. <laughs> Actually, I'm trying to go to GNOME 3 properly, but the only extension of GNOME Shell that implements tiling that I found is not yet particularly good. Uh, what are some big corporate users of Debian? Oh, big corporate users of Debian. So I can tell you the usual sponsor of our conferences, which is kind of related to that, well, all the big names. So Google, HP, IBM, uh, all these people have one interest on another in the Debian project. What is the next uh, change in the uh, development and packaging process into such a large Okay. For example, uh, changing the way packages are uh, packaged to use more uh, modern software. Yeah. Okay, so the way we do that, so actually there is a, a Debian developer who, who made a PhD studying how we push these kind of changes in the Debian community, which is pretty interesting. It's Martin Kraft who made a PhD thesis on this. But essentially it's a mixture of social pressure and annoying warnings. So before making, well, first of all, before making archive-wide changes that will affect all packages, we, we go through the policy process. So the policy process is the process in which we decide changes to the Debian policy, and it's very similar to the process you find in standard bodies, like IEEE or this kind of stuff. When a change is in the policy, we start changing tools that automatically check for compliance with the policy. And those tools will start to nag people. So you are doing something wrong here. The new policy said that you need to... Do, and then we start being more aggressive like reporting what we call mass bug filing. So we report bugs against all the archives saying, okay, you need to change this and that. And the mixture of all these factors allows us to, to do this kind of changes. The what, sorry? The, the use of the new yeah. system, it, does it begin at once when you, you're done checking that it's all right? I mean, do in, or at once the if uh, the packager use the new system. Oh, okay, so often either you need to change the package and do a new upload of the package, or you need to like, do a master build of a given set of packages in the archive to actually um, get applied a new change. You don't fragment the... Not necessarily, no. Usually the granularity of packages is, 
is defined is kind of intrinsically related to the to the user needs. It's not uh, artificially made by needs of change in the packaging tools. Anything else? Uh, what portion of the contributions that you get come from people working directly on Debian versus uh, the derivative? Oh, okay, that's a very good question. So, um, which portion of the contributions came from people working directly on Debian as opposed to derivatives? So, we do not have any specific earmarked way of keeping track of contributions. I, I'm, I don't know the portion, actually, but the amount of patches we are getting from derivatives is growing every single day. So we had a kind of uh, historical problem with the Ubuntu community because it was not clear they were giving back to they were giving back back to us. But that was that turned out to be in good part a communication problem, and uh, we actually started to reach out to them saying what were our problems, what why they were, and we are starting to see a lot of changes coming in from Ubuntu, but not only from Ubuntu. So essentially, we mon we monitor a little bit the changes coming from distribution from derivative distributions. We ask them to tag the, the patches they forward to the Debian backtracking system to monitor them, and the overall number is rising every single day. I do not know how to compare it with the changes made directly on Debian. My gut feeling is that the work done directly in Debian is still way higher than what we get from derivatives, but I mean, that's not necessarily bad. Yes? So I used to have a NN hundred with Mavo on it, which was oh. awesome. So is there anything that um, either Debian or derivatives are doing to try and target mobile? Because um, I have Android now, but I like Mavo a lot better. Okay. So um, the answer to that is kind of complex because for Debian itself, the mobile market is a market that we have trouble dealing with because it's too fast moving for us. So it's not something I think in general a volunteer community could easily attack because the need of the market are, are so tight that you really need to, to, be, to be on a schedule and you can only do that if you have a, a lot of you know, employees working eight hours a day on that. Uh, derivatives could do that better, of course. Um, but so I'm not sure that Debian could be in itself a good fit for this kind of market no matter what has been screwed up by all the companies who have been trying to, to put that on telephones, that's a different matter. But I think Debian would be a perfect distribution, for instance, for, instance, for uh, second generation phones, like the last gen previous generation phone. You have a market of you know, the last, last generation phone with the, the operating system you want, but if you want to recover the telephone of last year, having a Debian-based distribution would be great. But we don't have a specific um, interest of companies working on that. And then there is also the matter of, to be on that market, you need to do all kinds of agreements with like vendors. And you know, spending your time s signing agreements with companies is not something a volunteer would do, because you couldn't care less about you know, gaining something out of that. So that's, again, is something that should be better tackled by companies who want to use Debian as a platform and take care of the business part of that. Anything else? I think I'm running out of time. So, thanks a lot.